Hello, welcome to the fourth episode of the Progressive MS webinar series hosted by the MS Society of Ireland. And today we're talking about occupational therapy. And this is a subject that's a little bit dear to my heart um, as I'm working on a trial at the moment called the Cobb MS trial, which is about a cognitive therapy for people with multiple sclerosis. And it is administered by occupational therapists. But I also use occupational therapy in my home all the time. So uh, this is a very important aspect of treating your life with multiple sclerosis, and it does make us stronger, makes us a little bit better. So today we're uh, interviewing or talking with Lorna Spellman, who is an occupational therapist with the HSE or the Health Service Executive here in Ireland, and she works primarily in community care. So our discussion will revolve mainly around that, though we will touch on areas outside of it probably as the conversation goes on. Lorna uh, graduated in 2015 with a degree in health promotion and physical activity, and she wanted to pursue, pursue a career that focused on people's health and well-being. And she discovered the world of occupational therapy and found it aligned with her values and her passion to enable people to increase their independence in a way that is meaningful to them. She uh, returned to academia in 2017 and completed a master's in occupational therapy. Since then, she has worked in a broad range with a broad range of people across a variety of practice areas in both the NHS, National Health Service in the UK, and the HSE in Ireland. She focuses on enabling engagement in a daily activities and promoting both physical and mental health. So, thank you very much for coming, Lorna. It's a great you to so have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Looking forward to it. So the, really the first question that I'd like to ask you and is how would you describe occupational therapy? What, what is it? Yes, uh, so how I describe it is occupational therapists assist people to maintain their independence or to improve it. So whatever that means for the person themselves. Uh, and how we achieve that is we use occupations. Uh, I think sometimes people can get a little bit confused with the words. They, they think it's just employment solely, but occupations is really everything that we do every day. So all of our everyday activities. So if a person wants to get out of bed in the morning, go down the stairs, brush their teeth, drive their car, they're all occupations and they're all things that we can focus on, depending on what the person wants to achieve with their therapist and what goals that they set. So it sounds like it, it is... Um a process of dialogue between the person with the illness and yourselves about how you can help them. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, at the beginning of the process, you do an initial assessment. And I think why I, OT is often uh, really quite difficult to define is because it's so broad. There's such a massive scope. You know, we work with a range of populations and conditions. Um, and with that, we're also trained in physical and mental health. Now, obviously, you have OTs that work solely in mental health or, or physical health settings. But we do have um, a, a sort of a holistic approach, I suppose, in comparison to other health professionals. Um, so that's the, I think it, it's why it's maybe a little bit tricky and to define so as I was saying when we first meet someone we, we would do the initial assessment with them and and from that see what the person is struggling with so what is your MS stopping you from doing and what is it that you want to achieve it's very important that we work in collaboration with the person to achieve the goals that they want to there's no point in me setting out a load of goals that's not important to the person so we work with people to say okay well what I really want to achieve and it it could be something simple that we take for granted every day. I want to shower independently. But for some with MS or a range of conditions, that can be really quite tricky to, to achieve. So we would work with them in their environment, if that's AIDS, if that's strategies, if that's energy conservation. Um, so that's that's basically a sort of a whistle stop tour, but it is quite broad and difficult to, to define. So hopefully as we keep chatting, uh, it'll become a little bit clearer. I, I see how this can be very confusing for people uh, yeah. with MS what is an occupational therapist because you're overlapping with uh, psychology you're overlapping with physio uh, physical yes, therapy physical, yeah, yeah, right absolutely. and to me the way i i see occupational therapy is it helps me do the things that i can't do on my own exactly yeah right yeah as, as some people define it helps you to do the things you want to and, and need to do on a daily basis and I suppose as you say it is quite broad but at a basic level no matter if you're working with children older adults whatever the case is we're just focusing on pe and making people more independent and assisting them to achieve the things independently okay so let's start diving into the the deep bits of this so starting with the home and how 
phys- how occupational therapy can help me in the home? Yeah, so typically in, in primary care, what we typically do is we uh, often do an awful lot of home home visits and um, home assessments. Uh, oftentimes we do clinic appointments as well, but uh, it's great for the OT to get into the person's home and see their home environment because it tells you so much about the person and it's great to be able to feed that back to the MDT. Um, so oftentimes you will always, always see a, an OT with their measuring tape. So typically we're going in, we're taking some measurements um, and it's, it's just all part of the initial assessment and that's either informing what we do now or 10 episodes say you know in years to come um, should the person need some sort of equipment for that so typically the things that we're looking out for is how accessible is the environment is it everything that you need to hand is it, it's very easy for you are you um, going through un- unnecessary um, uh, activities to, to, or a necessary task to try and achieve what you want to do is everything sort of close to hand um, a large role we have is is false prevention um, I suppose with primary care and community care and salauncha care, there's, there's a massive drive towards um, um, preventative care and care in the community. And I suppose preventing those hospital admissions. So especially with false prevention, it can be sort of sometimes a stitch in time says nine. And I think OT sometimes sometimes get a bad rap of um, we have a thing about hating mats or rugs on the floor um, and always asking people to uplift them. But, you know, it, it's preventing falls in that way or advising you on lighting or your flooring or your level access, grant applications and um, that that's typically the, the at a basic level what we do and then dependent on what the person wants maybe I, I could be just going in to do a cognitive assessment for someone's cognition and um, but typically if, if we're in the home environment we're assessing it and maybe making recommendations for now but also maybe we should think about planning longer term and what the person might need down the road. Uh, this is the aspect that I found most interesting about occupational therapy but I, I also found it very challenging because uh, Like you say, an occupational therapist came into my home and assessed my particular situation and my mobility is an issue. Okay, so trips and falls are are one of the aspects. So I have a walking stick, but I also have a frame that I use and I use functional electrical stimulation to keep me moving around. Mm -hmm. Things like uh, a mobility scooter as well. Great, okay. But the, the going from being able to walk and then having the occupational therapist say, well, Robert, now your walking is disimproving. You need to start thinking about other things. Mm -hmm. So I remember that discussion. We were talking about the mobility scooter, what type I should get, but also things like a car. Should I need to change my cars that it's suitable for the scooter, but also suitable for me. And I found that actually really challenging at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sure. Is there a way of making that uh, as a patient? Are the things that I can do to help prepare myself or prepare other people with progressive MS to prepare themselves for this eventuality that you know mobility will be a problem? Do you, do you understand what I'm talking about? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's great as well to talk about your own experience, especially for people tuning in so they know exactly what the OT would have done with you in your case. Um, with that, yeah, of course there's things um, the person can do, but I think it's it's to also include your therapist in it as well. So that's our role as well, to support the person through that. Oftentimes, you know, a, a large part of my role is providing wheelchairs um, for, for wheelchair mobility, power mobility, that sort of thing. Um, and I, I, I appreciate that people see, you know, when I land with a wheelchair or I even bring up the discussion, they think, oh, no, the MS is getting the better of me or I'm giving into my disability. And I, I know it's very, very easy for me to say it because I haven't gone through that personally. But what I would say is maybe it's about shifting the perspective in, and this is just coming from my clinical experience and work that I've done um, that it's about shifting the perspective to it's it's not a restrictive um, piece of material it's actually your independence and it's going to improve your quality of life there's a lot of studies on it in um, uh, that participants were involved in that, that use, use wheelchairs and they have great little excerpts um, throughout the study and it says things like it's my legs it's my freedom it's my ability to get to a and b and um, so as opposed to looking at it as, as a restrictive piece of equipment it's more so 
enabling you to engage in the occupations you want to. Um, so yes, okay, by all means, if you want to pursue your mobility and that's your goal, that's fine. But I suppose if you think of it as more so an energy conservation piece, say if you want to go into town shopping for the day and you're adamant that you want to walk, which is fine, you get there, you're exhausted, you're drained, you feel like your legs might give way. And, and by the time you get there, you think I have no energy to actually engage in what I want to do. And now I have to cut my, my day out short and I have to go home. So maybe it's about looking at it. Well, you really want to go shopping. You want to go to the pub. You want to go to a football match, the cinema, conserve your energy getting there. And when you get there, you can trail through clothes racks for hours and enjoy that. So it's just um, while we do appreciate how difficult it is to transition and to accept that, yes, my mobility has deteriorated and this is the next stage of my diagnosis. I, I completely understand that that's very hard. But at the same time, it's maybe just shifting the, the perspective, I'd say. And I have to agree with you 100 percent on what you're saying, because when uh, I got a, a new stair lift there recently. Oh, great. Okay? Yes. Uh, and that's maybe about a month and a half, two months ago. OK. And when I made the decision to get that, uh, along with the occupational therapist, it, it was to me accepting my lost mobility. Uh, and I found that challenging at the beginning. But now on the other side, OK, and I have the stair lift, it has opened up things to me now that I couldn't do because I didn't have it. Now, for example, and I'm just going if you look behind me, you're going to see some kind of exercise equipment. OK. Yes. Um, Very cool. uh, and a bike and uh, an exercise machine. But when I use those, maybe for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, my walking gets down to zero. I just, okay. I just can't. And my exercise equipment is in the basement of the house. And that stair lift allows me to exercise more than I did before getting the stair lift okay. because I could use all the energy for the exercise machine and not climbing up the stairs yeah. afterwards. Isn't that okay? so interesting? Yeah. Going to your point. And this has actually made my legs stronger and I have more stamina now because I'm getting the right exercise. Exactly. exactly. Okay. And I think that's something that is people don't see necessarily with occupational therapy like you say, it's actually liberating. It allows me to do the things that I couldn't do mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of wheelchairs and, and mobility scooters, that type of stuff, a, a friend of mine over in the UK uh, has a particular challenge in, in that she lives in a town that is a market town. And the, all the footpaths are cobblestones yeah. or rough, uneven surfaces. And she's finding a huge difficulty using crutches in that environment, but also using her scooter in that environment because the, the ground is uneven. Okay, yeah. Is, is there anything that goes between that, between the, the crutches and a powered mobility scooter? Can a wheelchair work in that environment? And yeah, I'd just love to hear yeah, yeah. what kind of options mm -hmm. there are. Yeah, for the person, of course. Again, depending on what the person's goals are and that, that's how the, the whole relationship and the whole process with the therapist goes throughout the OT process. But I would say I'm not um, entirely certain on the criteria for, for the NHS in the UK. Um, I can only speak from the, from the HSE criteria, but um, if it was a case of, of contacting your, your occupational therapist, and at it, what I would say probably in that um, in that sort of situation, probably a powered wheelchair might be the best thing. Uh, now, again, I suppose I can't advise on any specific cases as I don't know her personally, but yeah. um, what I would say is, you know, it, there can be a little bit of a maybe a mix up between mobility scooters and power mobility wheelchairs so mobility scooters is typically for for maybe transport purposes only typically outdoors i mean it can vary person to person what they need it for what the person is really quite independent can transfer on and off independently and um, when you're looking at power wheelchairs um, what you're looking at is, is it provides postural support as well as the support of the wheelchair both indoors and outdoors so more maybe more so an energy conservation piece and also if you had any postural deformities and um, that you needed to be accommodated in the chair, it could also be provided with that. Um, I, I suppose if you're looking to go down that route at a basic level, uh, I'm sure the criteria is similar. What you need to look at is your home environment. If something like that would fit the turning radius, have you got the space? Are you in a confined sort of environment? 
um, and uh, also your visual ability if you've had um, your eyes checked recently what, what your visual field is like and also your cognitive ability uh, and your function and uh, just to touch on cognitive ability as well I know that you know you might see people on power chairs and when you're driving along you think oh that looks very straightforward it's just a joystick but actually there's a there's quite a long process to it in terms of the training sessions you have to complete with your OT and then also negotiating the environment and different environments you might be in depending on where you are and how you're going to manipulate ramps and curbs and all of that sort of thing so with that if that was something that was appropriate for that lady there are about um, typically three different types of powered wheelchairs um, and it's dependent on, on the placement of the wheel. So there is a, a mid wheel drive, a rear wheel drive and a front wheel drive. So the mid wheel drive, as you know, it's just that the, the, the wheel is directly in the centre of, of the chair. And that's great for people in confined environments because the turning radius is very, very tight. It's really neat. Um, and not to even say confined environments, I think even in my own home, um, that, that would probably be the, the best option for, for people's typical sort of home. Um, but with that, you know, there's pros and cons to each one and maybe that wouldn't be the best for, for her needs. So um, what uh, might be most suitable for her would either be the rear wheel drive or the front wheel drive. The rear wheel is um, probably the most stable and also the quickest. I think it's maybe, is it six miles an hour it goes, um, see me flying it. Um, and, and that's great, you know, it has anti-tippers on the back, so it's more so, it's really uh, tailored for outdoor use. So if you're going up a steep hill, you're not gonna uh, have the risk of toppling over. And likewise, the front wheel drive is great. The, the wheels are at the front of it and, and they can um, uh, get climb over obstacles a lot easier. So if it was a case of cobblestones or a curb or um, uneven terrain, um, something like that is probably the most appropriate. Um, that's typically what I'd say is, is probably what our options are um, if a mobility scooter or if a crutch was, wasn't suitable. Some people also find rollators really useful, the three wheel walkers. Um, they're just little, little walkers that either have three or four wheels on them and the physiotherapists will usually um, uh, advise best on that and what's the most suitable for the person. So I'd say contact your OT and physio and, and just take it from there. Uh, one thing that I saw that was quite interesting recently is that <coughs> with a, a standard wheelchair, you can actually get a, an addition to it that you clip onto the front of it that okay. makes it a powered chair occasionally. Okay. So it's a bit like a motorbike idea. Um, see. One of the things that I have experienced since I got my mobility scooter, okay, yes. um, is in Ireland it rains and it also can be a little bit windy. Um, and keeping warm in that environment is really a big challenge. Um, I, I've, that was a big shock to me when I started going out. My legs were frozen. And okay. unfortunately, with MS, uh, temperature sensitivity is a thing. Um, and when I came off the scooter, I would swore I ran a marathon because right. my okay. legs were just like dead entirely. Yeah. Uh, are there... <laughs> What type of things should we be looking at in that respect? Well, I suppose typically if you're going to be using it outdoors, you're, you're dressing for the weather and the Irish weather that we have. Um, I suppose the best thing is probably layering up because um, you can take off or add on as, as required. You know, you don't want to go out with a big jacket or a big coat and, and then be left to just uh, jump around on, underneath. That's typically what we'd advise for the person. Um, as well, it, it's a good point to bring up in terms of also care for your for your mobility scooter or your wheelchair. Um, if it is the case that you have three steps into your house and you're awaiting the grant um, for adaptations to your home, where are you going to park it? Um, you know, especially if you're in a city or a town, people mightn't have sheds or especially at the front of their house or able to access the back garden. So it's definitely, definitely something to take into consideration when you're, when you're considering going down that route. Now, moving back into the home, Again, so um, one of the things that I used to love um, is cooking. and Grace, yes. it, But now with my legs being weaker, uh, standing up has become more of a challenge. And as a result, I've stopped cooking, right? Okay. Um, are there any things that can make that experience a little bit better? So, for example, you know, I've got my legs is one issue, but also that my sensation in my fingers is starting to, it's not great. Yes, yeah. That, that is something that I got a lot of pleasure out of. And of I loved when I cook something and I could see the pleasure in somebody else's face when they had a lovely meal, right? Of course, yeah. And I've lost that now. Is Very there anything important. that can be done to help improve that situation? Yeah, what I would say, um, and again, I suppose it's dependent on county to county and CHO networks, depends on what your, your service can provide. Um, something that uh, can be also purchased online is a perching stool. 
I don't know if you've maybe 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 heard of it before and yeah. they're great devices because they can be used throughout the home either at the kitchen at your hob or at the sink if you're having a strip wash um, what they are is they're just really quite a tall chair and, and the cushion on the chair is, is tilted it's at an angle um, because the idea of it is that you're literally just supposed to perch on the chair um, now I know when I worked in Scotland I had given out a few of them and people were actually sitting and saying oh this is far too high for me and I said no no you're just supposed to perch it's just a rest and um, because as we know if you're sitting down when you're doing a task, if you're doing laundry or cooking, you're saving about 25% more energy than if you're standing during it. And in terms of the energy conservation piece, piece and fatigue management that we had spoken about, that, that's one thing I'd say that, that that would really support you in that task. Um, in terms of the sensation piece, what I would say is um, something that we provide or, or might advise on is um, the utens utensils that you're using. And again, there, there is great equipment out there online uh, on, a, on a host of sites, you know, um, Home Care Medical, Murray's, Beachfields, that's not exhaustive. But there's so many things that you could have a look at and see, you know, is it that um, it's my sensation because it, there's such um, a narrow width of utensils with a wider grip, would that, would that support me? And it could be something as simple as um, something wider like that, or even a foam grip around around your utensil similarly with pens and um, you know if you're putting on makeup any sort of little eyeliners that are really fiddly and, and hard to kind of grasp anything like that and um, I would say you could spend hours online looking at the aids that are available to people actually that's some one thing that I didn't think of because I'm a man is that the, the whole uh, makeup and and yes. the way you look okay yes, yeah. now I, I like to look well um, but uh, uh, important. the Going out into the world when we are allowed to after COVID has all you know died down a, a death, um, it is that that personal appearance and being able to look after yourself and present yourself well. That can be hugely exhausting, you know. Absolutely, yeah. is it, starting off with the shower bit, you know. Mm -hmm. exactly. I, I, I have to have a stool in my shower. I can't yeah. stand up in it, so I, I have to do that. But even the lip of the shower getting in mm -hmm. and out. Mm -hmm that's a huge challenge yeah. for me. Um, when we're coming to bathing, showers, toilets, what type of things should we be looking at? Hey, it's really interesting you say as well about the lip on your shower because genuinely when I do go into some houses and um, you know people don't even think of what their shower looks like and I just say oh my god look at the height of your lip and they say what are you talking about you know some people have like a nine inch lip on their shower and you think how do you manage that you know um so yeah it, and it can be I appreciate it, absolutely exhausting especially then when you're showering or bathing and you have the heat of the shower that's going to wear you out more getting back and then you know trying to dress in that situation it's very difficult like that, as you mentioned, um, there's lots of aids we, we can provide in the shower, in the bath, and um, depending on which the person prefers to use, something like a bath board that's it's just a four slatted board that sits directly over the bath, so you can enable you to to have your bath or a bath lips, Neptune bathers, that sort of thing, and also showers like shower stools um, or, or wheelie shower commodes if the person's mobility was that little bit poor and they need to be wheeled into the shower if they had the access for it. What I would say about that is, is just trying to really be clever about um, about your personal care and, and uh, when you're timing it, when you're doing it. When do you find your it, it takes less out of you? Is that at night time? Is that in the morning time? Uh, especially in terms of dressing again there's so many dressing aids you can get such as a sock aid it's basically just a metal piece of equipment um, and you, you tie your sock around it and there's two little ropes on it and it kind of slips your sock over your, over your foot um, something like a, a helping hand um, it's just one of those things that you see people picking up litter um, on the road uh, people find that great for assisting them to pull up their trousers if they just had function in one hand um, there's great things um, I've, I've um, uh, always recommend them to people a uh, little button hook and because I know for you know it's very easy for me to say just wear loose fitting clothes and things that you can just pull over but people want to wear their shirts they want to look smart so it could be something as simple as instead of having to button your buttons having a velcro between your shirt or there is a button hook that is just a tiny it's it's I'd say you could make it for about two euro it's so simple it's just a little utensil with a hook on the ends and you put it through your shirt through the hole grab the button and you can just pull the button through um so they're more so the aids, but as I said, thinking about it cleverly in that, you know, I suppose when I worked in, in the hospital and that, and when we usually um, assist people to wash and dress in the hospital, we're always doing it sitting down. So if you can, you know, start in your bottom half and you're, you're, you have your washed yourself, you've dried yourself, maybe sitting on a towel, and then you're donning everything. So donning is just putting on everything, your socks, your pants, your trousers, your shoes, and then you're standing up once and pulling everything up. So it's just trying to think of it, you know, and, and 
and take out the steps that are unnecessary and you don't need to you don't need to stand up three or four times and waste all that energy and um, so i'd say it's just having a think and thinking how can i do this much easier for myself it's all about planning and pacing it is, really yeah. isn't it uh, you know and i i've i know myself i've i catch myself like i when i'm particularly tired i try to make only one trip and try to get as much stuff carried or brought yeah. in that mm. one trip so when i'm dressing i like to get all my clothes together plop them on the bed yeah. then i sit down and then i get dressed yeah. uh, and then you forget you know and it just is exhausting. You're just mm-hmm. thinking, well, God, I'm going to have to get up. I forgot my trousers or whatever it is. Yeah. Are there any tips that you can give us on how to build those routines? What do we, how can we create the habit of doing it the right way? Yeah, I, again, it's, it's just really a, a, a planning piece, um, I would say, um, and just getting into that routine of, um, I know even just for myself, I, I typically lay out my clothes from the night before, so I have everything there for me, and it's just part of my routine, you know, I do, you know, I wash my face, brush my teeth, and then I get my clothes set out the next morning, and it's just about building it into your routine, Um if it was a case that someone felt that they needed extra assistance, of course, you can um, talk to your OT or your public health nurse about um, home help, depending on your age or personal assistance, if that was what you were maybe thinking um, down that sort of road. But I would just say really being organised. Um, I know myself as well in the last few years, I've gotten better at you know, just having um, clothes for the weather, like a summer wardrobe in winter. There's no point in you trailing through 10 winter coats when it's roasting outside. That's exhausting, the weight of them. Um, So just having things to hand. Um, And I think there's a great tip that I heard recently on a podcast about, you know, um, being organized and and dressing well. And it was about, um, you know, say if, if if you had to go to work in 10 minutes and you could basically trust someone to go into your wardrobe and pick out anything and you'd be happy to wear it so it's really just you know that they wouldn't come back out and say oh not that not that not that so you just have what you wear all the time you have it to hand you know not that thing that you wore 10 years ago that doesn't really fit and that's the first thing to hand that's typically what i'd say it's just all about planning being organized and having prompts as well you know obviously with the cognition piece and um, if you if you find that you're forgetting to lay out your clothes or you have everything and you forgot your socks and oh the you know the effort of it um, I just say maybe set an alarm on your phone each night and after two or three weeks you'd find that that's just part of your habit and part of your routine yeah I, actually my grandmother may she rest in peace used to do that all the time she used to have mm-hmm. post-it notes right and she okay, would yeah. put it beside the cooker and she'd write the cookers off so she <laughs> know that it's off yeah. and all different things like that or for example I've got um, I have to charge the battery for my scooter so I bring the battery into the house and I, I charge it. And one time I went out and I forgot the battery, yeah. of course. Yeah. So now when I bring the, the battery in, I put a post-it note on the door to say the battery's in the house. <laughs> so I remember. Perfect, yes. But it's, it's little things like that that can make the world a difference. Like that day when I went to Galway and I had no scooter, I just had to stay in the car. I just couldn't move out. So I lost something. I, I suppose that taught me a lesson. Yeah, 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 the hard way, the hard way. But yeah, you're right. And it's just, it's such simple things. And I think sometimes as OTs, we might have some sort of imposter syndrome because we think surely everybody knows this, but I suppose we're doing it every day. And it's just little things that you can add into your routine that make, makes life that a little bit easier for you. Um, one thing that uh, you mentioned earlier about uh, grants and applying for stuff. And in my case, I was very fortunate. I got a, a grant from Galway County Council for my stair lift. Yes. Um, and that really made a difference. How is that process in Ireland for getting those, uh, say, the housing uh, adjustments or that type of stuff? How difficult is that? Can I ask out of interest how long it took for you to, to get the funding and for the stair lift from, say, application to, to receiving your, your stair lift? I think I got that all done in about three months, three and a half months. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. So yeah. again, it varies from person to person. It could take three months, six months, nine months. Um, and especially with COVID, you know, that's really going to delay it. Um, with any house that I, I really go out to, I suppose we've really been advised to, to think again with a preventative approach and always, always forward planning. So, you know, if I see someone with a nine inch lift and they can manage fine and they look like they're going to be great um, for, the night, for the near future, I always say, would you maybe think about the grants? Um, there's an application process online on gov.ie 
Um, and there's three different grants that you can get, but it's typically the housing adaptation grant for older people or people with a disability. Um, now it is means tested, so it's it, um, and you need um, medical clearance, so your doctor needs to write a letter to say yes, this person is in need of it. Um, and really, what you know, it, it's great in that um, it, it depends on, on your situation. So even if you needed your windows replaced or um, if there was a hole in your roof, they do that those for repairs. But typically, what we would advise it for is for a level access. So say if it was the case that a person is in a two-story house I have advised maybe you should consider living downstairs but that's not they want to continue living upstairs which is their goal and which is perfectly fine then I'd say okay well maybe we're going to have to think about level access we're going to have to think of a stair lift to get you up and down the stairs um, so with that um, it depends on what grant you're applying for you might need an OT report for um, say a stair lift they might need to do maybe a cognitive assessment with you to make sure that you're okay or for extensive work if you're putting on an extension with um, a a bedroom and a, and a level floor and um, level access shower um, but for for smaller um, things that you're that you want to change in your house just like a level access shower they can do that and then they have guidelines um, as well for um, what exactly dimensions it should be because they're again they're for planning in that yes okay there's enough space for one person but we need to think what if the person needs two carers in the future and have we the right dimensions for that? So I'd say just fill out the form. It's great. There's, there's a checklist on, on page 20 and 21 and it just make sure you have all the documents so it's not coming back to you. Send it to the council and, and you'll get your, hopefully get your approval then and, and get the work done. Um, and just lastly, what I would say is, is do it, I suppose, like when you don't need it, oftentimes I, I find people are discharged from hospital, I go out and they need the changes right now and then they go applying for the grants and it's six months, you know, so I'd say, you know, if you feel like maybe this might be something that I have to face in the next few years, maybe I should have a look at that form now. And I think actually that that's really, really important for certainly progressive illnesses like MS. It's planning ahead for not just today, but next year and the year after. And those conservation things that saving energy planning ahead but also i know i know myself psychologically i needed to get myself in the right frame of mind so that i could move on to that next step exactly, exactly. now what helped with that was obviously the occupational therapist explaining what i might need in the future okay, okay. yes i found that really helpful but also the community helped as well i remember speaking to a friend of mine declan who was in a, is in a wheelchair and he said it liberated him okay. and that to me was that turned the key it suddenly yes. was yeah. oh okay i'm going to be better off as a result of this yes, um, exactly. exactly okay uh, for the people who are uh, listening to this at the moment uh, you can ask questions and we've got one question here um from uh, somebody who's attending and he asks, I can only type with one finger and I like writing. Can you offer any suggestions as to voice assisted technology? And this guy works on a Mac. Okay, um, interesting. I know that there are some aids in terms of um, uh, different types of keyboards that could maybe facilitate that for you. Um, I know that there is um, uh, also communication aids you can get in terms of voice projection and that sort of thing. Um, I would say, um, I, I know from my own experience um, working in primary care in, in this setting, but I, and I, I presume it is the case in the rest of Ireland, that might not necessarily be something that will be provided. What I'd say is maybe call your local occupation therapist in your primary care centre and ask, um, but it's also no harm just to have a look online and see um, and what, what the best thing is for you um, that they typically. Yeah, I, I know myself, I use a Mac myself and uh, yes. they, they have this wonderful dictation system yes. on it that yeah. you can just, you know, double tap the, I think it's the, um, I can't remember what key it is. I, anyway, you have to tap the function key, you have to tap it twice okay. and uh, suddenly you can speak and it'll type, yes. which yes. is, uh, I'm starting to use that now because typing is becoming more and more of a challenge. Uh, that, that certainly it would... would it does help and uh particularly i find on phones now because you've got the likes of google assistant or siri exactly. and you can just ask your phone for information and it finds it for you and i find exactly. that really really beneficial 
so many people use Alexa as well or, or other sort of assistive technology in their homes and they find it brilliant in, in terms of that, in terms of recording something, reminding them of something or prompting, um, you know, if it's a medication reminder or if, it, if it's like that, if it's writing down something you want to remember for later on, if you happen, to, um, if it's, it's too tiring or too um, energy consuming to type it out. Um, so they are brilliant aids and, and a lot of people use them. Yeah, and I've also noticed that um, Microsoft in their applications do give a dictation facility as well. Oh, great. Okay. Which, okay. Um, yeah. So that means that it can work on PCs as well as Macs. Yeah. So that, yeah. that's and I mean, you can, um, you know, even if it wasn't on the PC, if it was something separate, you can obviously get them as well. I know some OTs I've worked with because we often go from house to house and you, you obviously have to do your documentation on time. And some people find it really useful to, to dictate into a phone and, and then you can do your notes later on. So I don't know if that's maybe um, a, a cheaper option for that person to, to maybe have a look at. Um, okay. Um, now, uh, one of the things that we... Uh, have to talk about it in a sense is work and when you're pro getting progressively worse the work environment can become incredibly challenging yeah. um so things like you know again accessibility if you and i work in the university in galway distances can be difficult or even things like sounds or light those type of things are there Anything that we should be looking at in that respect? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, at a basic level, in terms of your level access, um, I'd say it's a long journey for you to work from your work to your car, you know, to save as access to your badge. Um, what we spoke about, about power mobility and the benefits of that or a scooter. And really, it's about talking to your employer about, about your needs and, and they um, really have to be able to facilitate that for you in order for you to, to work on and to complete your role. Um, what I would say as well is, is a, a useful title to be aware of is um, vocational rehab is a, a specialist area that's what he's working um, as well as that um uh, the AOTI, the Association of, of OTs in Ireland, they have a website and they have a list of uh, a, a range of private OTs throughout the country. Um, and they might say, you know, their their speciality might be grants or it might be home environments or it might be vocational rehab. And it might be no harm because they can actually, um, I suppose, facilitate a conversation between you and your employer and say, OK, I've done an assessment on this person. They find that, that life is really difficult for them. We're going to need to look at a different room or a different environment for them. So it can be quiet and they can achieve their role. And um, what can you do? To facilitate that these are my recommendations and then it's up to your employer to follow through on that and um, so that's what i typically and it, it, i i know this isn't your particular area but i can imagine that conversation with an employer can be very difficult if you are looking for you know adaptations to be made to the work environment so that you can get such as ramps or maybe yeah. a door that is open electronically that type of thing yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, but again, I mean, if they're going through the grant application process, it's great in that it's not coming out of the employer's pocket, really. Um, one, one lady I did work with, um, you know, e even at a basic level, I was kind of talking to her about just being honest with, with her um, colleagues. You know, there was just so much going on. She was, she was an admin worker and there was so much um, uh, expected of her, um, you know, answering phones, doing this, doing that. And it was just about, you know, OK, answering the phone is everyone's responsibility in the office. But, but that was too difficult for her to process that information, to note it down, to remember to pass it on to the important person um, that it was going to. And it was just, well, we, we'll just cut that out of your role. So it's just maybe even saying to your colleagues, I, I can't really cope with that. that that's, um, you know, it's not really important for me to, to continue my job and I can focus on something better where it is a little bit quieter, where I can maybe work from home. Um, and just talking about those, um, I suppose, where your strengths are and working with that um, as opposed to. So, so that that cognitive thing that you're talking about, th this processing, yes. um, I have that challenge. It to me, it, it's difficult if I have more than one voice yes, yeah, talking, it, say at a meeting or in a family gathering. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I find that my brain just melts. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, is there any tips that you can give us to help us have that conversation with the people that we're with? so that they can adapt to our needs. Yeah, I, I, I know from, I, as, as you know, I was involved in the COB-MS program and, and that's something that we talked about and different strategies to use with that. 
Um, with that as well, you know, it was great in that the participants were at different stages in their life and with that had different um, issues that they wanted to sort out in terms of their cognition. Um, and one lady like that uh, found it very difficult to, to be in groups. But I would say, I mean, it is difficult. Um, uh, something that she had found that was really very useful to her was um, just focusing in on one person at a time and, and asking people to speak that a little bit slower. And I think as well, you know, with MS, um, I think people often assume that it's just physical um, and it's just, you know, your mobility and a deterioration that and there's there's not much I, I feel anyway um, knowledge on, on the cognitive side of things. And for another lady that was in the group, I was actually, you know, um, her family thought that she, you know, was just forgetful and that was just her personality. And she had to say, no, this is my MS and I need you to, to speak slower to me or, you know, I'm, I'm not that great at solving problems anymore. I need more time. Um, and it's just being honest with your family and your friends in those in those groups and saying I can't keep up with, with everything that's going on around me and um, can you do it a little bit slower so that's, that's something I'd maybe. Are, are there things that people with MS should be looking out for particularly I'm talking about cognition because as you say it's really invisible and a lot of people yeah. don't necessarily realize it's an MS symptom. Yes. Yeah. Are there things that we could be um, watching out for now that are maybe hints at what might be coming along and who should, who should we talk to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as well as that, you know, and it's also not to scare people, really. I know that some days my memory, oh my goodness, I actually, I'm on, on home visits, I've, I've forgotten things behind me. Actually, about two weeks ago, I was on a visit and I had forgotten, I think it was, it was my folder and I went back and then I got into the car and I had forgotten my keys and I went back and he said, what have you forgotten this time? So, I mean, it, it's to say it's a natural part of life. But also in that, I would say if it's something that's happening quite a lot and you're finding, um, and you know, I, again, another sort of strategies to use I found even with myself that it's because I wasn't paying attention so you know if you go come home in the evening and you throw down your keys um, and the next day you can't find them anywhere it's because you're not um, attending to the task and processing that information so you're not able to recall it then the next day when you need it so it's thinking to yourself okay I'm leaving my keys here and um, so I'd say maybe just um, trying to be more attentive if you find that maybe you're, you're struggling with your cognition a little bit what I would say again is if it was something that was happening a few times a week, if it was something that your family had noticed, if you're watching a series with your partner and then you know the, the next episode comes on and you have totally forgotten the, the storyline. If you pick up a book you were reading the night before and you think, I, I don't know where what, what the last chapter is about. Um, and I know some people have said that they've had to reread and reread the chapter and then never get to the end of the book, that sort of thing. I'd say maybe it's maybe um, no harm to say it's your GP or your OT. Um, again, occupational therapists have a, a massive role in cognition. And what we really do is we, we screen for if it's maybe a mild cognitive impairment or if there's something going on there. Um, and it's great again not to scare people you know it, it's not the case in, in dementia I suppose where it's maybe a deterioration of that but with, with MS there are strategies that we can implement with the person um, and I suppose it's to not look at the screening tool or the assessment as a test but as um, a kind of it, it opens this whole world as to how we can help you so as you know there's a lot of cognitive domains you know there's your attention there's your delayed recall executive functioning more so your problem solving your orientation so a person might struggle with orientation in terms of they can never think of the day the time whereas their attention and recall might be great so it's just to to open that up to say okay we are doing the screening but if i know that it's your attention that you're struggling with then i can give you these strategies to assist you with that it, it's interesting i did a, a cognitive test myself there fairly recently and um one of the things that i was having difficulty with was recalling something that was said say 15 minutes ago Okay. Right. Yeah, so and I know with memory. these um, webinars, that is my huge, huge channel challenge. Remembering what you, the question that I asked you yeah. and listening to your response yeah. and it takes a huge, huge amount of com uh, concentration for me. Mm -hmm. And then tomorrow, this afternoon and tomorrow, I'm going to pay the price for that. Okay. That's just the way it is. Um, are there ways that we can make that ability to concentrate on something stronger? Is, is it like a muscle that we can exercise? Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose there, there's steps to your cognition as well in actually taking in the information and, and um, uh, yeah, your brain has to actually encode the information to sort of sort it. 
um, I suppose what you're describing there is maybe your working memory or your short term memories is sometimes referred to. So working memory would be more so, OK, you know, what's five months by five? So you have to hold the question in your head and sort of figure it out and then get the answer. So your, your memory sort of that's why it's more so called working memory. Um, and it, it's just a process of, of your, your mind being able to encode that data really and put it into your memory. What I would say, again, is the attention to the task. Um, I, I think that that's really, really important if it is something that, you, OK, you know, the, you know, I suppose day to day you can think, OK, I can get through these things. It's not it's something not, not a big deal. I'm going to chat, nothing I really need to remember. But if there's something very important, I would say just to sit down and really try and give it all your attention. Like you say, that it's quite exhausting trying to focus on something for so intently and um, so maybe for if you could do it for a shorter period um, and then again using any aids that you can and um, using that prompt and um, you know phones are great calendars all of that sort of thing um, and what I would say as well is some some tips that I got from participants that were doing the, the MS program which is great because you know obviously people we can advise but people at MS are the experts in it they found that even just um, in, in terms of prompting themselves if they didn't want to depend on a phone or on a calendar was even just writing down um, the first letter of the word on, on their hand so it wasn't giving yourself the answer but it was prompting you to, to come up with it and think okay it began with see what is it you know I'm in the shop uh, and it helps you to remember it. Interesting. So there's a couple of other things here. We're getting very close. Uh, you know, uh, it's <laughs> believe it or not, we've hit 45 minutes already, Lorna. It's it's flown by. So I, I I just there's one or two things here in the chat that I just want to say. Um, Michelle Murphy did a webinar on cognitive research from rehab in Galway. It could be something that could be worth listening to. Um, and uh, Francis said uh, he had to stop working as as his job became impossible, is there any way of retraining or finding a job if we could just yeah, again, I'd say for him to maybe look and see if there's any vocational re um, uh, rehabilitation therapist in your area. Um, so vocational re rehab is, is likely what he would need to support him with that. Um, and it might be uh, obviously, like I suppose, re-educate or tra retraining in the role, but also looking at a way to adapt to him and to his needs. So maybe that's a shorter working week, shorter hours, whatever it is, whatever his concern is that's stopping him from working is what the, the OT or the therapist will focus on. Okay. Um now we've come to the end um it, thank you very much lorna it has been an eye-opener uh, very useful information and in fact i think there's a lot more that we could actually talk about which Absolutely. is it's a pity that we don't have the time so maybe we could come back to it again yes. at another date That'd be great. Uh, i just want to let everybody know that the next episode is going to be on june the 24th and we're going to be talking about how to manage anxiety or fear which is when you have a progressive illness, that's the way it's going to be. You know, you're anxious about the future. So I, I'm really looking forward to that episode. Again, Lorna, thank you so much for your time today. And I'd thank like you. to thank Aoife Kerwin and Aidan Larkin for helping us to put this webinar together. And I look forward to seeing you all in a month's time. Thank you very much. Robert, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, you know, our NICE guidelines and everything that informs our practice that we're supposed to be working under and our recommendations is recommending an MDT approach. And, and with the webinar, I think that's what you're really facilitating for people in their own homes. Like OT is great on its own, but it's not until we come together with your doctor and your physio and your dietitian. That's it. So I, I think it's a really valuable resource that you're providing to people. And I think a lot of people will get benefit from us. So thank you for having me. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.